Um, so I won't give your intro. I'll do your intro separately. I'll just get straight into it. Of course for me. Uh, welcome to the Raw Heart and Soul podcast, Sean Croxton. Hey, thanks for having me. Really appreciate you having me here. I appreciate your time because I know how busy you are. Um, congratulations on your thousand episode of Quote of the Day show. Thank you. Isn't that crazy? You know, started at number one and now we're all the way at a thousand, a thousand and one today. So just, it's amazing. I never thought that it would get to this episode. I actually, you know what's funny is I almost quit the podcast at about episode 130 something or so. Like I literally recorded like, this is going to be the last podcast and da 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 And I'm going to go back to doing interviews. And then I came back to my senses over the weekend. And uh, here we are 900 something episodes later. What drives you to keep that particular podcast going? Like what, what is it what, that makes that different to underground wellness and the sessions because i'm going to ask you a little bit about that but since we're straight into it that's a great question um number one it's easy it's a very easy podcast to do um probably takes me about four hours a week to find all the clips and to record the intros and the outros and so it's very simple of course somebody else does the editing for me so so that was part of it because when i was doing underground wellness and when i was doing interviews for the sean croxton sessions which is the podcast that i did after underground wellness um prep time for a podcast can be anywhere from 20 to 40 hours. It was a lot of preparation and I kind of got to the point and you know, the fact that I was so well prepared made the interviews amazing. He would be like, Oh my God, like that's the best interview I've ever heard. You're the best interviewer I've ever heard. My guests would be like, that's the best interview I've ever given. Um, you ask questions and nobody else asks. Like, I feel like we know each other now. Can we go out and have dinner? You know, that type of thing. Um, but after doing that for seven plus another one year, um, that was really draining. It's just a lot of work. And I felt like I was learning about other people's expertise and promoting their expertise without allowing myself enough time to develop my own expertise as you know the go-to person in such and such field. So, so that was the reason why I moved to the quote of the day show. And also, you know, podcasts are really long. A lot of podcasts, like an hour, hour and a half, sometimes two hours, you can't consume them in one sitting. And I know with the quote of the day show, 12 minutes or less, five days a week, people are going to enjoy it. They're going to get something from it. It's going to change their day and they can do it in one sitting. So do you think that um, that benefits your community in a different way to what Underground Wellness did and what the Sean Croft sessions did as well? Uh, you know, I haven't really thought about that, but... You know, just just the the fact that I know that if somebody listened to the show this morning, as opposed to them not listening to the show, their day is going to be better. You know, underground wellness was a whole different thing. There was a lot of information there. There were things you really had to think about. You know, there were uh, there's a lot of conflicting information out there in the health space where people are like, oh, I just learned some new thing, but it's different than what I learned last last week. And it kind of turns into like a, a mind F. There's just so much conflict there. With the quote of the day show, I don't think anybody walks away from the show going, but somebody said something different last week. So now I don't understand. They can just say, okay, here's the basic principles for how I want to live my life. Here's what I need to do. Here's how I need to think. Here's how I need to feel. And they get that reminder five days a week. And so it's just like their morning cup of coffee and, um, you know, very simple idea, but also a pretty darn good idea. That's an amazing idea. It's, um, it's awesome. And it's awesome to see that it's stayed number one for as long as it has, because I've followed you for goodness knows how long, I think since your YouTube days. And to see that, um, progression and to see, I think with the quote of the day show for me, it's like a drip feed. It's not like, to, like, it's like as a check practitioner, sometimes I get accused of being a little bit like Paul in that you open up the fire hose when you give information to people sometimes. And sometimes that information is too much too quickly and um, too hard for them to take in because they can't absorb it. It's like that water that's coming really quickly. And the quote of the day show seems to be like, like you said, like it's, it's shorter. So it's, not as hard to consume. Right. It's all about habits, number one. Yeah. You know, getting, the, getting in the habit of listening to it every day and also just about it being very easy to consume. That was the intention. That's what I wanted. With the fire hose, fire hose, you're going to maintain or retain about 10% of that. Mm. You know, you're going to have to repeat listening to that over and over again. So you're literally subjecting yourself to a fire hose over and over again so you can pick up and retain more bits of information. That's a lot of work and the average person doesn't want to do that. 
they or just ha- want short and simple. Right. They don't have that capacity in their brain to absorb all of that information because we don't use enough of our brain to do that. And to make those changes that they need to make is much harder for them when it's in those big lots of information. Absolutely. Totally agree. Um, can you tell us a little bit about yourself starting at why you became a personal trainer and how that evolved into becoming one of the first YouTubers that I knew of and then first podcasters in the health space. I know you probably weren't the first, I know you're smiling, so you're probably not the first YouTuber, but in terms of someone who was really successful with that medium and growing your business that way, I think you were one of the first. Yeah, I definitely was one of the first. I was just, I was smiling at the journey of like where it all began and where it's taken me. You know, like Steve Jobs says, you don't connect the dots looking forward, you connect the dots looking backward, exactly. right? Yeah. It's like, when I was a personal trainer, I never thought I'd be, you know, teaching a course on money mindset. No, no clue that that would happen. And so, you know, sometimes we try to control the journey and we want to know step by step what's going to happen. You just got to just let it go and let let the universe do its thing. But to answer your question, I wanted to become a personal trainer because number one, I was just into fitness. I was always in the gym myself and still am into fitness. Um, But I wanted to be like the world's greatest personal trainer. I wanted to rid the world of obesity. And I took all these classes, got a kinesiology degree for some reason, not realizing wow. that I could have taken a weekend workshop and became a personal trainer. I know I right. did. <laughs> straight. College was fun. Um, did that for eight years, but I think I was mentally done in year number three. Mm-hmm. I was like, I can, I, I, I just, it just wasn't doing it for me. And on top of that, my, my feet were killing me. Like just being on my feet all day was killing me. And so um, YouTube started, I think I started personal training in 2001. YouTube started in 2006, 2007. And you know, the, the three or four years prior to YouTube beginning, I was actually beginning to read information from different experts in the health and wellness field. Paul Cech, um, Dr. Mercola, uh, Lauren Cordain, Weston Price, Francis Pottinger. And I was going, wow, like most of what I learned in school was totally wrong. And I'm going to the gym and I'm telling people about it. And I worked on a university campus and I'm like, no, nah, it's BS. Fat's, fat's bad for you. Da, 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 da. You know, you shouldn't eat this. It's, da, da. I'm going, wow, it's just real food. And um, when YouTube started, it gave me this platform where I can share these ideas that nobody else wanted to hear. And it was just perfect. And so I remember making my first video. And, and again, YouTube was very new and just seeing comments and seeing people subscribe was a pretty amazing thing and so that's where it really all began you know back in those days i you know was a guy with maybe a hoodie on with my hat on to the side yo what's up y'all today we're going to talk about hdl and ldl cholesterol and it wasn't the most credible way to present information it was entertaining but your average person not somebody who's a checky or something your average person would be like I don't know if I could trust this guy. So I thought that it'd be really a a good idea to have third party validation and to interview the people whose books I was talking about on YouTube to interview them on the podcast. So I started Underground Wellness in 2019, I'm sorry, 2009, I believe. And um, I think at the time it was just like me, Rob Wolf and uh, Jimmy Moore were the only three guys really podcasting in the house space. And then, um, you know, after that, the, the rest is just kind of history. How have you seen that industry evolve? Like when you talk about being um, in YouTube and realizing that you needed credibility and um, you needed, or you found an avenue for that by reading books and then interviewing people, did you have a, a foresight at the time that you were going to monetize that? Like, the, cause I know you've talked about in the past that, or you talk about it frequently that you read books for a living and get paid for it. Like that's an amazing job as part of one of your jobs. And that's as a kid who was a bookworm, like for me that, like that didn't seem like a possibility. So how did you connect the dots? Maybe you didn't connect the dots when we talk about that going from backwards to forwards, but was there a point in time where you went, ah, this could be a look like this could make me more money than being a PT. I think probably within three or four YouTube videos, I I said, well, this can be a business. I'm not sure how it's going to be a business, but I'm going to sign up all of these subscribers. And at some point, the idea will occur as to what I'm going to sell them. The first idea was, of course, one-on-one health coaching over Mm. the internet. And so that was the first thing that I sold to them. But I mean, when anybody would ever ask me in the beginning, the very beginning with YouTube, like, what are you going to do with this? Like, I'm going to turn this into a business. 
you know, this is going to be a really big business. Like, oh yeah, how, how are you going to do that? And da, 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 da. it's like, I, I don't know. Like, I'm just going to turn into a business. And that's what I did. Um, you know, in terms of books, I mean, I, I, that's always been the vision for me. It's so funny how your vision kind of becomes true. Like I, when I was a kid, I used to always say, I just want to make a bunch of money and I want to sit on the beach and I just want to read books all the time. And that's kind of come true to a certain extent. I very seldom go to the beach. It's a good 20 minute drive away, but I can see it from my house a little bit. So, you know, the, I'm getting closer to the beach, but that was, that, that was, that was the dream. And um, it's, it's just a, an example of what's possible, where if you become an expert in your field and you're willing to be seen and heard and really go out there and help people, uh, you can turn your information that's in your head, you can turn that into dollars through the service that you're providing by way of writing eBooks, by way of you know doing online summits, by way of creating your own online courses. But where that begins is with your service to the people. If you don't go out there and help somebody, then you're probably not gonna make any income doing it. In terms of your question about how the health space has evolved, I think it's rather, uh, um, it comes down to where you put your attention. You know, I see a lot of people out there, I don't really pay a lot of attention, to be honest, to the health space. It's just kind of in the past for me. Um, I pay more attention to the personal development space. But in terms of what I pay attention to, I see some people out there killing it, um, putting out really good information, but I also see a lot of um, bullshit, you know what I'm saying? Uh, Fear-based, yeah. you know, Bill Gates is the, the devil, um, where I feel like w if the mission is to be able to be complementary to medicine, if the mission is to get the average person who doesn't know anything about holistic health, who needs it, to bring them in the doors and say, hey, this is a really natural way to heal yourself. It makes sense. It's different than what the doctors are telling you to do, but what the doctors are telling you to do probably isn't working anyway. So here's something to look at. But I think for some, I won't say a lot, some of the popular influencers out there, they're putting out very weird information that I believe scares a lot of people off. And it, it really screws up the credibility of the movement that we have going on here. We've done a lot of good for the last decade or so, but I think we've taken a couple of steps back. And I think uh, in terms of the influencer space, we're more concerned, in my opinion, from the outside looking in, of getting a rise out of people rather than actually giving them very good information. And that's where I get concerned about where we're at in the health space online. Again, I'm not going to say I pay a ton of attention to it because most of the stuff that I don't like, I've unfollowed. And right. so I, yeah, I'm just speaking from, you know, what I've seen. I think that's um, like, I get exactly where you're coming from because people are very much, there seems to be at the moment, and I think we're talking, if I'm guessing right with what you were saying, we're talking about the last six months or so, and that would include times of COVID and everything that's going on around that as well, because it's a massive shift in energy for everybody in the world, if they're willing to see that. But um, what I have seen is that people are extreme ends of the spectrum. So they don't want you to sit in the middle. And um, people are wanting your opinion, not your opinion, they want you to take a side more frequently now. Whereas I think in prior to this happening for me, what I was seeing was that um, people were more open to be going, oh, okay, you sit there. Um, I don't understand you. I don't like it, but um, I'm not going to change, try and change your mind on it. Um, mm -hmm. Whereas now on both sides of that spectrum, so whether you for or against or believe or don't believe in something, they're going, they want your answer and you're either with me or you're completely against me. You're the mm -hmm. enemy. And um, do you think that's because of the, um, is it the unconscious, um, like the, the energy at the moment, like because it is so fear-based? I, yeah, I think people are just scared. We're uncertain. There's a really good book called The Science of Storytelling by Will Storr. And you know, he writes about the theory of control as it relates to the brain and human beings, how we feel like we, we, we really want to have control. We want to know what's going on. However, in times where there's gaps in information, where there's chaos, where there's unknowns, what the brain likes to do in order to feel like it's in control is to fill in the gaps with a story. And that story typically has heroes and that story usually has villains as well. And so the story isn't 
if I say, hey, what's your story right now about COVID? And I would go, how do you know? How do you know that for sure? And they'll be like, I don't know, I just believe this. And they're like, why do you believe that? Well, I'm not sure because such and such said it. That, that's maybe why. Okay, well, how does such and such know? Why do you believe them? Well, I don't know. Who is such and such? Oh, this is person on Instagram. And so we're just grabbing information to make it fit so it makes us feel better. So we feel like we're more in control than we would be if we didn't do that. And it's literally just the way that the brain is wired, especially during times like this. Mm. And that can be a very dangerous thing, like you said, with getting that information from sources that don't know themselves for sure. And I don't think we can know anything for sure, but where that information is coming from can be a very dangerous place. Yeah, question, question your beliefs. You know, that's what I teach in Money Mind Academy. Question your beliefs. Question what other people tell you. You know, investigate things. Know that mm, there's a lot of gray area out there. You don't always have to be black and white. You don't always have to be on the extremes. When you're on the extremes, it's, it's just like you're clinging to being right. And that clinging to being right is so ego-based, you know, where it's like, okay, I'm right about some stuff and I'm probably wrong about a lot of things as well. I think a lot of people don't want to feel like they're wrong because to feel like they're wrong means they're kind of out of control. They don't have the control that they want and their perception of the world may be off if they're wrong about some things. You know, everybody believes that their belief system is right. Right. That's why it's a belief system. You know That's what I'm saying? The and there's 7.7 yes. 7 billion of them in this world, but we're all like, mine is right. Mine is right. Like, you know, through my evolution and my development, I understand that a lot of what I believe probably isn't right, which is why I don't really believe it. I just kind of just go through my day and say, hey, um, I'm open to learning more and to taking that on and seeing if it fits. But if there's better information out there, then I'll, you know, I'll check that out too. It's just, that's, that's kind of like how I like to think about things instead of clinging to one extreme. I just also, I just want to say real quick, um, why they do that? Because it works. Extremes yeah. work. Yeah. They work really well. It'll get a lot of follows. It'll get a lot of clicks. Extremes it, work. It polarizes people. So it, yeah. Donald Trump's the president. You hate him or you love him. He's the president's most powerful man. Kanye West, you either hate him or you love him. Yep. Kim, Kim Kardashian, you either hate her or you love her. That's, that's where influence comes from, making people feel something. That is the essence of an, if, that is the essence of an influencer, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's funny how that works. Funny how that works. What do you think sole purpose is? And do you have another term that you would use for that other than sole purpose? Sole purpose. I'm not even sure understand what that, what that means. What do you mean by sole purpose? So for me, sole purpose would mean what you've been, the, the job or the role that you've been pro brought here to fulfill or to do. So have mm -hmm. you heard of, or have you heard of Carolyn Mace? Yes. Yep. So archetypes and, and Carolyn's belief, belief is that you're born with a sole purpose. So that mm -hmm. when your soul enters the human body that you've come here with, I guess kind of like a mission, but I don't like to call it the word mission, but um, a job to do to fulfill before you, you leave this plane, or you might have multiple sole purposes. Okay. And the question was, the question was, what do you think your sole purpose is? Or do you think you have a sole purpose? Gotcha. You okay. Yeah. I think my sole purpose is to help people live better lives more abundant, healthier lives where they can do whatever it is that they want to do. You know, we're, we are born to be abundant, but we just have all of these blocks, you know, whether it be our belief systems, what we value, uh, the conflicts that we have in terms of what we want and what we believe about that thing. Um, it, it's, it's the, the friends that we spend time with, the programming that we have, our self-image, our sense of self-worth, our self-esteem. Um, what I want to do, my purpose here on this, on this earth is to help people to navigate those and to raise their self-esteem and to re-examine beliefs that they probably got before the age of seven that are literally steering them through their lives where their past is becoming their present and their present is becoming their future and nothing really changes. You know, I want people to have a, an understanding of how they work, how the mind works, how the brain works so they can step back and observe their behavior and go, why am I doing this or why am I not doing this? What is it going on within me and in my brain that I can change so I can change the circumstances and conditions of my life. Like the health space was cool. 
um, very fruitful for, for me, like in terms of fulfillment and financially as well. But what I understood from that space was <clears throat> the clients who got the best results were the ones who had the best attitudes. You know, they were the best thinkers. They were the best thinkers and feelers. They had had a higher level of consciousness. They were willing to help themselves. But we live in a world that is is full of learned helplessness. You know what I mean? I'm helpless. Yeah, I have no sense of agency. You know, I have no sense of myself being able to have not all, but some control over how my life turns out instead of surrendering to just whatever will be, will be. You know, um, fate will be fate. Um, my job, you know, to, to further elaborate on this is to help people to realize that you do have control and that you can change whatever you want in your world. Just believe in yourself and believe in the possibility because what Steve Jobs had or what Elon Musk has or what Sarah Blakely has, you know, they don't have anything inside of them that they, you don't have inside of you. It's just all about committing to that possibility and being willing to go on the journey and the journey. And here's what people want. People want the straight line journey. Yeah. You it's know? no such thing. <laughs> yeah. There is no straight line journey. No. The journey is a journey of course correction. It's mm -hmm. you go and you hit a, a bump and you go a little bit off, off um, course and then you correct and then you go a little bit off course and then you correct and you correct and you correct. Mm -hmm. And throughout that process, you get to ask yourself a very important question, which is who am I? You know, who am I? Who am I? Am I somebody who quits? You know, or am I somebody who's going to look at this obstacle and look at this seeming failure and look at it as a lesson? And I'm going to grow through it. I'm going to go through it and I'm going to grow through it and go to the next step. And then by the time you get to the place where you want to go, you're a whole new person. And that's what life is all about. It's about self-discovery. But if it was a straight line towards what you want, there would be no self-discovery. No. you know so that's what i want to show people long answer but that's my deal that's a great answer um when did you first start to understand or know your sole purpose and i want you to go right back to your childhood because for example when i was a kid and i didn't know this whilst i was a kid but i used to look in the mirror and i would stare at myself in the mirror and then i'd stop myself from staring at the mirror thinking um it's not right or it's not normal to stare at yourself in the mirror like that's and it, I probably would, if I had words for it, and I didn't have these words, I would have thought that that was um, getting a big head or having an ego, like we used to call it having, or yeah, getting a big head and um, being full of yourself. But now I look back and I go, I was looking for something deeper because I could see something deeper within there and myself like looking into my eyes and knowing that and seeing that there was something behind what I could just see in the mirror was my beginning of understanding what my sole purpose was and looking deeper within myself when mm. or did you have a moment like that when you were a kid or were there moments like that along the way when you're a child that led you to find this purpose that you know you have you know um i can't think of anything specific or a specific time i just just Something told, there's probably a couple of things. Number one, I'm not sure where I got this. It might've been from family. It may have been from the movie Back to the Future. I was watching it the other day and I was like, is that where I got that from? Because it was about the right age. Um, you can do whatever you put your mind to, you know? Yeah. For some reason that, that stuck to me. And I remember being a kid, I used to love playing basketball. I still love playing basketball, as a matter of fact. And, you know, there's a game we play called 21. And, you know, there'd be days where I'm down 19 to five. The other player just has to score one more basket. And I remember I would just get an image in my head. I'm talking seven years old. I would just get an image of my head, in my head of winning that game. And I tell you, 9.5 times out of 10, I would win that game. You know, and it's just like, and, and even in school, if I made a decision and I had a picture in my head, like I'm going to get straight A's this semester. Yeah, I got C's and B's last semester. I'm just going to go ahead and get A's and I would get straight A's. And I just knew that whatever I put my mind to that I can, I can do it. And then I saw my dad being an entrepreneur and I was like, I want to do that. You know, I want to sell stuff. I want to help people. I want to like sell products and, you know, make money and not have to work for somebody. I was never really good at working for somebody. I have authority issues. I don't like to be told what to do. Right. <laughs> and so, yeah. 
And so, I mean, I guess it just, it just kind of came from a combination of all of those things. And I remember um, John Martini saying that the amount of money that you have will always be in direct proportion to the quality and the quantity of the service that you provide. Yeah. You know, and I, got to, I heard that and I go, wow. And I started to look at what's the quality of my service? What's the quantity of my service? For what I want, which was a six figure income then, am I giving the quality and the quantity of service that it's going to earn me the, that amount of money in exchange? And the answer was no. You got people all over the world like, I want to make more money. Well, what, are you, what service are you providing? Right. And how many people are you giving it to? Do you deserve to have $100,000 in terms of your service? Deserve from service? You know, no. Okay, cool. Well, we got to change that. And so, you know, that, that's, that's where, I guess that's where my pur purpose came from. It's just, you know, a combination of those things. Um, you talk a lot about your dad and his entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial um, attributes. Where else did you learn or who else did you learn service from? Where uh, else did you see that? Shoot. Um, it's a tough one. I mean, I know my mom worked a lot. I, I, just, I just feel like I'm just, I just how I'm wired. You know, it's just how I won, I won the service award at like eighth grade graduation or something like that. You know, I was always the, the kid who, you know, if we had an assembly and there was tables to break down, like, I was, hey, you need some help with that? Like, I just, I just like helping people. That's just always been my thing. Helping people feels really, really good. And now we have this internet thing and you can help more people, you know, all at the same time you know, with a non-physical product that you can make once and you can sell over and over and over again and help people. Um, yeah. That's, that's kind of where I just, I just, honestly, I just think I'm wired that way. Nobody had to teach me to go out there and surf. So if you've got clients in your program who say to you, I want to make money, I don't know how to make that money. Um, where, like, where, what would you tell them to try and start to uncover how they're going to bring that out within themselves? Because um, it's not actually from what I've seen, not, um, it's not in the majority of people who are like you or, or like myself who, who want to serve or who have that ability to tap into that and see um, what others can't see in themselves. I think, I think number one is to ask them, what are your gifts? You know, what are you, what are you good at? And if those things that you're good at can actually help some people. It's like Steve Harvey says, you know, you gotta identify your gift. You know, if you're good at cutting hair, you can start a hair business. If you're good at changing oil, you can start an oil changing business. I think a lot of people, they want their purpose to be this high and mighty thing. Mm -hmm. You know, like it's gotta be huge. Like your purpose can be just, you're gifted at cutting grass. You know, you can start a business out of that. People make really great money cutting grass. And so just to identify what your purpose is, number one. Number two is to identify your limiting beliefs, especially around money. Many people have limiting beliefs around money, if not all of us, because of what we learn before the age of seven. And, you know, when the brain is developing, to kind of give you a shorthand of this, you're trying to learn how to survive in the world. And the people who are around you, those authorities in your life, the grown-ups who you thought had it all together, and now being grown up, you're like, wow, grown-ups really didn't have it all together because I don't have it all together, right? That's the illusion, isn't it? It's the illusion. And so that, that uh, time in your life when you're so impressionable and you're building this wiring in your brain and your brain is, is wired for survival, you're taking on the beliefs of other people if they believe it, it must be right. And then you get to the point in your life where it's like, if I don't believe this, it can create a problem for me because I might get kicked out of the tribe. Ostracized. The brain, yep. the brain I mean, I think that's the biggest obstacle for most people is the possible loss of love and connection, which is Maslow's third rung of his hierarchy of needs. You know, right above that is self-esteem and right above that is self-actualization. But it's mm -hmm. that third rung where people get stuck because to have self-esteem means that, you know, you can handle anything that comes your way and you honestly don't really care what people think. You're just gonna go ahead and do your thing. But we're so stuck in our wiring and our brain is so trying to protect us from being kicked out of the tribe that we tend to always, we step out the box a little bit, that familiarity box, and we come back in because of the unknown. 
the brain does not like the unknown. It wants to feel safe. Like, Let's just keep everything the same way because, <laughs> hey, success for you, you've never had success before. Right. It's unknown. That's and scary. It's scary. It, it, and, you know, I, I took a class with Dr. Uh, Serini Pillay last week, and he's the author of one of my favorite books, Life Unlocked. And mm -hmm. um, it's a book about fear. Mm -hmm. And uh, he says, you know, most people aren't afraid of, you know, their future goals. You know, what they're afraid of is their emergent self. You know, that version of themselves that they've never met before. They're afraid of that. Essentially, they're afraid of their own greatness. Because as you start to pull more of those things out of you, you start to develop more of those qualities. You start to make changes in your life. That's scary because every aspect of your life is going to change. And every aspect of your life changing is not the status quo. It's not what your brain wants. And that, excuse me, social effect is so important because nobody wants to be alone, especially now. You know, how do you find new friends now? It's, it's kind of interesting. How do you do that? It's really hard. It is so really that's hard. Why, that's why in Money Mind Academy, like the biggest part of Money Mind Academy is the community part. Like at noon today, I'm going to do a two hour call with our, our students. We do it every single Friday, even between semesters, and they get to support each other. I don't even really do anything. I just, mm -hmm. I just unmute people and they just help each other out. And that's, that's what they need because if they don't have that, if they don't, they don't have that new environment, they can change their beliefs all they want. But if they keep going back and hanging out with the same people, you know, who had the mindset that they had before they took the course, their mindset is going to come down at some point to meet the level of these individuals. And we don't want that. Yep, they go back to that same vibration, don't they? And they don't hold the vibration that they've, the new vibration. Exactly. Um, so in your life then, in the authorities that you had, um, did you have to, or have you been questioned by those authorities about the choices that you've made? No. That, it, that, that So that you're programming and unwinding that programming, because um, I've come up against this in about six months ago, around Easter time it was, with one of my family members who questioned what I was putting out on the internet and um, said via text to me, the family is very concerned about the direction that you're taking. You haven't come up against that with your family? Not against that. You haven't come up that as a learning curve? You know, I, I've heard that happen many times. I mean, there, there was a point where, you know, a few years into underground wellness when I, was, I really wasn't making great money. My, my brother sat me down at breakfast and was like, hey, man, these people don't want to change. They don't want to be helped. I think you should stop doing this and you should go sign up for the police department in Oakland. Yeah. This much money, da, da, da. I'm just sitting there like, number one, fuck you. Number two. <laughs> You know, just, just, just wait and see, wait and see. Right. And then, um, but other than that, my mom, you know, my dad's been gone, but my mom has always just been like, do whatever you want to do. You know, there was no, like, you have to be a doctor. You gotta be a lawyer. You gotta be a dentist. There was just like, go do what you, you want to be a personal trainer with a college degree. I don't give a fuck. Go and do it. You know? Um, so I've got zero pushback from my family. I've gotten pushed back from friends, you yeah. know, that I used to have before. But other than that, I've been I've been lucky. And honestly, I was so committed to underground wellness and I had that vision and I knew what it can be. It didn't matter who you were and what you said, I would have tuned you out anyway. Yeah. Do you think that's faith? Or do you think that's yeah, you think it's faith? That is a deep belief in myself. Yep. That is a deep belief that whatever I want to do, I can do. Like, I don't like, you know, Will Smith one day, he says, you know, I believe that one day I could be president of the United States. Like, that's a deep belief. You know, mm -hmm. I don't want to be president of the United States. But I believe, like, if tomorrow I woke up and some desire came out of the ether and was like, hey, we want you to build rockets. I'd be like, well, all right, let's go on Amazon. Let's build, let's buy some books about building rockets. Become the expert there. at that. Yep. Yeah, I'm going to sit in this house for two years and I'm going to connect with some people and I'm going to learn how to build rockets, you know? And it's just like, I just, that's what I want. People are like, how do you leave a multi-million dollar business with underground wellness to create something new? Because, well, number one, I've done it before, but number two, like, I believe in myself. Yeah. It's, 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 if, it, if it is to be, it is up to me, I'm responsible and 
you know, it's a matter of like, do I want to sit around all day and scroll Instagram and watch Netflix and bullshit all the time, like 95% of the population does? Or do I want to sit here and like learn some stuff and take some breaks, of course, but learn some stuff and over time become an expert? If I rewind to five years ago and I think about, I did this interview, this really short interview with JJ Virgin when I first got into the personal development space and she knew me from the health space and she's asked me these questions about how to change your mindset. I'm like, uh, um, uh, um, affirmations, uh, 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 you know, I didn't really know what I was talking about, but five yeah. years later, I can break it down on a neuroscientific level, but you just got to progressively get there. You got thousands of books in this house. You just read and read and read and you learn, you learn, you relearn, you learn, you learn, you learn. And at some point you're like, man, I know quite a bit of stuff. Let's go teach somebody. What are your non-negotiables that you do every day to keep you on your path? And do you know, I'm going to rephrase that. Do you know when you've gone off your path? Because I think with, from what I could feel and see from underground wellness, and then when you did the Sean Croxton sessions, there was an element of, there was a big element of frustration. And that came across sometimes in some of those latter interviews of anger. And, and then you just shut off completely. Well, that's what it felt like. Like you, you made the decision to stop underground wellness and it was done. And then the same thing it felt like happened with the sessions as well. That like it was there one day and the next day it was like the next week there was no, there wasn't the next podcast. And I was like, yeah. well, what happened? And then you went to London on a holiday and I was like, where the hell has he gone? Like what's happening with Sean? Because he was like, I was relying on you and you've gone now. So what? Yeah. Okay. So, so, um, Underground wellness. I got to the point where, you know, the seven year itch, it had been seven years, you know, I needed a new challenge. I needed something new. And I also felt like, you know, I've said this many times, but it's, it's, you can be on my, I can have a guest on my show this week. And that guest will say, whatever is wrong with you, it's vitamin D deficiency. <laughs> and the next week, next Tuesday, somebody else is, is on the show says, you know, what's wrong with you? The same thing the other person was talking about last week, it's your adrenals. And the next week, the person says, oh, it's uh, your genetic mutation with your MTHFR. Mm -hmm. And I honestly Follow thought, Papa. I'm confusing people. Yeah. You know, I'm turning people into, um, uh, what's the word, orthorectics. You know what I'm saying? Orthorexics, where people are just like, stressed about their health all the time because they keep getting conflicting information. Mm. And for me, I just kind of got to this point. I'll, I'll never forget. It's my main man. I love him to death. He's my dude. Dr. Tom O'Brien, I was doing a, a, a webinar with him and I just had a headache that day. And he says, um, Sean, uh, you have a headache today. Uh, have you eaten gluten today? <laughs> and I had to keep it real with him. You know, he's like, have you had a Cyrex test? And I'm like, in front of people. And I shouldn't have said this. And I think this was like, kind of my breaking point. I was like, Dr. O'Brien, I think it's kind of silly that you want everybody to take a Cyrex test. I just have a headache. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Let's have a headache. Mm. You know, it's just like- There's No reason, no need to pull that apart. It just is. Yeah, I just, I just have a headache and it's, it's okay. It's gonna go away, it's fine. And I just, I just wasn't feeling it anymore. Mm. I just wasn't feeling it. And so I, I, there, was, there was hundreds of thousands of dollars in the bank you know what I'm saying? And so I was like, if anybody can decide to just shut down a business and move on and follow his other passion, it's me. I've got enough money that last several years, you know, maybe more. Let's just take some time off. Let's go on vacation. Let's go to London. Let's go to Rome. Let's go do some stuff. And then when we come back a year later, um, I didn't go away for a year. I mostly, I mostly sat around the house for a year and read books, but let's, let's come back and let's start a new podcast. Um, however, doing the Sean Croxton sessions, it was the same obsession. It was like, I got to nail this interview. It's got to be the best Howard Stern, Barbara Walters, whatever interview. And with this quote of the day show idea that I, 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 I actually implemented maybe toward the middle of the Sean Croxton sessions, I was like, oh, this is so much easier. Mm -hmm. It's so much easier. And the, the listens actually look really good. The downloads look really good. Um, do I want to keep torturing myself preparing for these interviews or do I just want to go ahead and do this other show? And I decided to do the other show. And I don't think there was any anger at the end of um, 
the Sean Croxton sessions. I remember I had a, a interview scheduled with Preston Smiles. Was it Preston or was it? No, it was Danielle Laporte, as a matter of fact. And I read her book and her book was like, do what you want, you know, do what you want. Don't feel like you're, you're stuck doing something. And I was like, you know what, Danielle? I'm going to take your advice and I'm not going to do our interview. I'm Just fucking let it you. not, you know? <laughs> And I remember she she like she sent that 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 blog post that I wrote about that to all of her followers and she was like, cool, I was I was so ready to be on this guy's show, but he read my book and it literally changed stuff. And now I'm not gonna be on the show. It was just funny, you know what I mean? Yeah. And uh, you know, I'm a very intuitive person, and to me, the quote of the day show was the way to go. And I every once in a while I think about going back to doing interviews, but I wanna I wanna get my stuff out there yeah. instead of helping somebody to get their stuff out there. Yeah. right now maybe later i'll do that i know that you're short on time here and i i think i've got two more questions if you're okay with that okay yeah let's go um i've recently learned a thing from a guy named craig harper who's a podcaster here in australia he's actually one of the biggest podcasters in australia really cool guy but he calls it the echo chamber so we have people around us that we um gravitate towards because they support our beliefs and they they get us and they understand us and within that echo chamber you should have people who will give their honest opinion about things kind of like your support network do you have somewhere you go to get outside what i consider your echo chamber like to challenge your thoughts so that you're not just being reinforced with possibly ideas that are and beliefs that are building up your ego but not really building building up your spiritual growth. Uh, you know, I, my buddy David Sinek, who runs PaleoHacks.com, he's my guy. Who I'd be like, Dave, what do you think about this? He'd be like, well, I think da, 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 da. he's super smart and he's in our space, and so he's the guy who will kind of like bring me down and be like, hey, this might not be the best idea. And I also know that you may have tried this before and you kind of hated it, so I don't understand why you want to keep going back it. there again yep it's, it's 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 almost like and i hate to use the word hate but it's almost like because this year i went back and i was trying to work with health coaches again because yeah. i really want health yeah. coaches to do well and i remember running this idea by dave because i've been through this three times but this is my fourth time he's like hey man i'm not sure about this because i mean you've, you've done this with health coaches you know in the past and it just hasn't quite worked out man like they don't really want your help and I was like, no, it's going to be different this time. And I should have listened to him because, you know, in general, health coaches give no shits about marketing and, and messaging and sales. They just somehow want to weirdly book up their schedules with all these people that they never marketed to. It's really strange. Um, and, <laughs> you know, he was right about that because I tried it for a good, you know, few months there. And I could have tried it for longer. And if I would have stuck to it, I'm sure, like, something would have worked out. But I, I had this other Money Mind Academy thing that does well. And I was like, you know what? Divided attention never builds greatness. So let's just focus on this one thing because I am excellent at both. People actually want this. I can't make people want something that they don't want. Yeah. You know, and I think that's really important. And if you have any mm -hmm. listeners who are health coaches who are in marketing, like you cannot make somebody want something, you have to kind of exploit, you know, not in a negative way, but you have to exploit that all the, 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 the desire that they already have and create products and programs that fill that desire. But if there's no desire for marketing for health coaches or very little desire for it, then it's probably something that you can't sell. Lori Kennedy is doing a great job with it. She's been at it for a long time. Um, I don't wanna be at it for that long. Yeah, health coaches make me wanna bang my head against the wall to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I've seen that with you as well, cause I've seen you start those programs and it's kind of like that information comes out and then it's like a couple of weeks later I'll go, was he doing that or was he not doing it? And I'll look it up again and go, maybe he's not doing that. He's changed his mind on that. Yeah, but, but you know what? Here's the thing, like, if it's an idea, and I, even if I talk to Dave or somebody, they're like, don't do it. Sometimes I'll be like, well, I'm gonna do it anyway. And I'll do it and then I'll be like, hmm, I'd rather have done it and know that it's not a good fit than to not do it at all and to wonder, you know? Yeah, that's, yeah. That's, that's how I feel about that. What brings you joy in your life? Um... Or how do you create your own joy? What brings me joy? What I do. I, I love what I do. I love reading books. I'm surrounded by books right now. 
And I love helping people. I taught a class last night um, for my Money Mind Academy alumni, friends and family. And, you know, I was just in a zone, you know, that's what I love to do. Like, I'm just performing. That's what I love doing, you know, to see all the, the chat, like, oh my God, that, that blew my mind. Like that, that does it for me because I know what I do. There's only three or four people who do what I do on the internet. And I know that the chances that somebody would have heard what they heard last night from one of the other money mindset people was none because I teach it in a way and we get into neuroscience and all this crazy stuff. I teach yeah. stuff that nobody else is ever talking about. So I know that that nugget they got, they were probably never going to get that nugget for the rest of their life. And that nugget allowed, you know, something to crack open in them that wouldn't have cracked open otherwise. And that just like, mm, that gets me going. I also get a lot of joy out of watching basketball. I love basketball and I love hanging out with my friends, though we don't really see each other much because, you know, COVID and such. But um, yeah, I love watching basketball. It's my jam. Last two questions. What book has had the biggest influence on you and your career? Life Unlocked. Yeah, um, because I think that's what got me into the neuroscience of it all. And I also found out from that book that I have a, I used to have a very deep fear of success. Mm -hmm. um, I've read that book many times. I have many copies here because they're just destroyed by highlighters. Um, yeah. So that would be, uh, that would be the one, yeah. And what book would you recommend the most? Probably wouldn't be Life Unlocked because most people, they don't get it. Yeah. Unless they're into this stuff. Oh, um, uh, shoot. <laughs> hard question, huh? It is a hard question. So many of them. Or just a couple. Like if you were going to, if yeah. someone was going to understand you more, what would you recommend they read? I would go with Think and Grow Rich, of course. Yeah. I would go with the oh, science yeah. of getting rich. I would go with um, a book by Neville Goddard called uh, Resurrection. And if you want another good one by Neville, read uh, it's a really short book called Feeling is the Secret. Um, the Neville books can be a little challenging, especially um, Resurrection, mm -hmm. but because it's like scriptural interpretation. Awesome. But, he believes that the, the Bible is really a manual for how the brain works, like how your mind works. There's a lot of um, uh, metaphors and such in there. He breaks down like what such and such means. And so um, that's really, really good. But feeling is a secret. It's a little 12 page book. Get that and you'll be like, oh, I get it. It's not just about knowing what I want. It's about feeling that way now before it happens. And um, that's the missing ingredient for a lot of people. What are you thankful for? You're, you're, for people who are listening to this and not going to see it, across Sean's shirt, he's got thankful written across the front of his shirt. I got thankful all over. I got thankful blankets. I got all, I got all kind of thankful stuff. Right? Gratitude thing over here. Um, I'm thankful for literally everything. Yeah. You know, everything. I'm thankful for air to breathe. I'm thankful for water. I'm thankful for you. I'm thankful for the internet. You know, I'm thankful for my students. I'm thankful for the trees outside, this beautiful view I have from my office. I'm thankful for my hot tub. I'm thankful for my family. I'm thankful for literally everything. I'm thankful for the stuff that hasn't gone right in my life because there's always a silver lining in that stuff. And so I'm just thankful all the way around and um, can't beat gratitude. Gratitude is dope. It shifts your attention. And when your attention goes, your energy flows. And so focus on the good stuff. Where can people find you or where do you want people to look for you if they're looking for you? Follow me on the Instagram at Sean Croxton. I'm trying to um, boost up my Instagram a little bit. Also, um, follow me, uh, go to SeanCroxton.com. Get the free ebook, um, The Money Mind Reset. We put a new one up there in, in just a few weeks, but The Money Mind Reset is there right now. Five steps to change your relationship with money. Get that for free. Get on the email list. Money Mind Academy is... Um, we're opening up enrollment next week. So I'm not sure when this goes live, but um, the next time we do, it's going to be in January. And it's going to be a, the January Money Mind Academy is going to be incredible. I'm working on some bonuses. And so there's going to be a marketing course in there as well. So I'm taking oh, what wow. I was teaching with coaches and I'm actually putting that into um, marketing. We're going to have a uh, something where there's a program that shows you all of these different sources of income, like multiple sources of income, like mm. the, January package is going to be gnarly. 
Like, I'm really excited about that. So we are subscribers to the Money Mind Academy. Does that mean that we get that? Because we get lifelong access, don't we? Yes, forever and ever and ever. Forever, forever and ever and ever. ever. And that's what yeah. I love about you, Sean. We can always get you. I am so grateful and thankful for having you on the show. I look forward to speaking to you again soon. Thank you, Tanya. Appreciate it. Have a good day.